Well, hello everyone. This is Greg Anderson and welcome to uh, another episode of Life, Love, God, The Story of a Soul Traveler. Uh, this is the autobiography of Sunburst founder Norman Paulson, who was also a direct disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda. And in, in this particular podcast, we're going to talk about Chapter 8, The War Years. So, The War Years were 1939 to 1945. The actual World War II broke out in 1939 in Europe when the Nazis invaded Poland. Um, the United States didn't or enter the war until 1941 when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. But Norm was 10 years old when his parents divorced and um, Eileen bought a home in Northridge and uh, Don Prosser and Eileen were quietly married so Norm had a, a, a new stepdad and he moved to Northridge to live with them. And one of the things that Don did was he made arrangements for Norm to keep a horse named Duke. And this was Norm's first horse at the Prosser home and property. But there were stipulations Norm had to exercise and care for him. That horse had belonged to Will Rogers and had been one of his favorite polo ponies. And so Norm over the next few years learned to ride very well and together he and Duke won several ribbons at local horse shows. One afternoon, Norm was riding his bicycle through uh, downtown and he saw Bud Bouchard, a local farmer, driving through town pulling a trailer with a brand new four-cylinder diesel tractor. Now, the most popular four-cylinder diesel tractor in those days was the McCormick Farmall and you see a picture of a pristine one to the right probably very similar to what Bud's looked like because it was brand new. And Norm rode up to Bud and he said, do you need any anyone to help you farm? So Bud said, go ahead, put your bike in the, in the back and uh, uh, get in the truck. And he took him out to the farm and he gave him a brief lesson on how to operate a tractor. And then he asked him to disc the field and he left. Now, I don't know about you, I've had an opportunity to sit on tractors in my lifetime and just looking to figure out how to start the thing, let alone move it in one direction or another, is always a mystery. Well, Norm wrote, I followed my inner guidance, in other words, his intuition, and two hours later I sat there admiring my first completed job. So there's no doubt that Spirit helped Norm get this job done in those two hours, because when Bud returned, he was shocked to see what a good job that Norm had done and Norm asked him do I have a job with you and he said sure you, you sure do and Norm worked for uh, Bud until his family had to move away from Northridge so Norm also worked at a neighbor's ranch uh, May Kingsman and she was a horsemanship trainer for movie stars so in exchange for work on her ranch Mrs. Kingsman gave riding lessons to Norm one of Norm's favorite cowboys from the movies was Tom Mix. He was everybody's favorite cowboy. And since Mrs. King, Kingsman knew him well, he, she introduced Norm to Tom Mix. And Mix was retired and he was old at the time and he lived very frugally in a small farmhouse. Um, and Norm had a chance to meet him. He had a chance to shake his hand. He tried several times to see him again when he went to Tom Mix's ranch, but uh, uh, Tom was, n was not there. But what Norm wrote, he said, he was a real cowboy, not like the ones we see in our, our movies today. He grew up working on ranches. He was a champion roper, a champion horseback rider, and a shooter. Tom Mix was also, uh, according to history, a pallbearer at the funeral of his friend Wyatt Earp. Um, Tom had portrayed Wyatt Earp in one of the films and uh, Wyatt Earp was the consultant on the film and they became very close friends. And it's recorded that uh, Tom Mix was uh, one of the few people who openly wept at Wyatt's funeral. Uh, even though N Norm only met him once and was able to shake his hand that one time, he said, I was very thankful for the privilege of meeting him. 
1941, the U.S. entered the war right after Pearl Harbor was bombed. And there was a very large Lockheed uh, facility in Burbank, um, and they were expanding their facility, hiring 90,000 new employees to build the P-38 Lightning fighter planes that were used in the beginning of World War II. The plant was hidden from spy planes by unique camouflage. So you can see in the pictures here, before and after it says, the before is the Lockheed plant without camouflage. The after is the Lockheed plant with camouflage. And you can see from the air, you would never know there's anything here but a sparsely populated farming area. So both Don and Eileen took jobs at the Lockheed plant because they were good paying jobs and uh, it, it was, everyone was rolling up their sleeves for the war effort. And they had to work in Burbank very long hours and that commute was taking a toll on both Don and Eileen um, going from Northridge to Burbank and back every single day. In the summer of 1943, and Norm is now 14, he visited his father in Lompoc. He was shocked to see how Lompoc had changed due to the war. Camp Cook, which is now known as Vandenberg Air Force Base, had been built and army personnel had flooded into the city, increasing the population by four times. Charles confided in his son Norman that he was considering resigning as judge and moving north because this increased population was producing increased crime and increased work in his judgeship, and uh, I, I think he was getting ready to retire. Norm asked his father to help him get a permit to drive, which Charles was able to, to acquire for him on one stipulation. He could only drive during the day, daylight hours and not at night. And um, when he returned to Northridge, Don Prosser, his stepfather, helped him to find and, and um, get his first car, which was a 1934 Ford sedan. And you see here, there's a picture of a pristine 1934 Ford sedan. Looks like a Bonnie and Clyde car from the movies. Um, but Norm's first car didn't look that way. It was a, a junk heap. In fact, Don Prosser's first comment to Norm about the car was, you're going to have nothing but trouble with this pile of junk. It's a used car reject. And Norm answered, I know, Don, but it's cheap and I can fix it myself. On the way home that night, and he had to drive it home at night because that's when they purchased it, the car's headlights went out due, a, due to a faulty generator and a dead battery, and Norm thought, oh well, that's easy to fix. He writes that he was so thrilled at having a car that even if the engine had fallen out on the street, he would have made some positive excuse for it. But with his experience that he was getting in the auto shop at Burbank High School, he was able to rebuild the Ford and beef it up so much so that when a classmate challenged him to a race, Norm started out a two to three car lengths behind and won by 10 car lengths. Um, so this was his beginning of, of love of automobiles. One Friday afternoon, Norm had a premonition that something was terribly wrong. And suddenly in a vision, he saw in a flash two cars in a head-on collision. And one of the cars he recognized as his stepfather and mother's car. So as he had come in, there was a note from his mother that they'd gone up to Santa Barbara overnight. They'd return the next day. There was uh, some food in the refrigerator. Um, his, his Nana was actually in New York visiting relatives. So Norm is about 14. He's home by himself. No one came home. So Norm begins to call motels in Santa Barbara to see if they're, they were there. And he had no luck. He called Charles, his father, for help, and soon Don called from the hospital in Santa Barbara. Don told Norm that they'd had an accident, and both he and his mother were hurt and in the hospital. Norm wrote, The car was a total wreck. Don was cut up, but not hurt too badly. Mom had bruises, but she had internal injuries that she would never fully recover from. This reminded me, when I read this, of an experience that Yogananda had with his own mother's death. So he had been traveling with his father and he was uh, uh, staying in a small bungalow. And he says it was about midnight 
and as I slept beside my father on the piazza of our bungalow, I was awakened by a peculiar flutter of the mosquito netting over my bed. The flimsy curtains parted, and I saw the beloved form of my mother. She spoke. Awaken your father, her voice was only a whisper. Take the first available train at four o'clock this morning. Rush to Calcutta if you would see me. And then she vanished. Yogananda told his father, and uh, they didn't leave immediately. They left the next morning, um, and they had received a word by the next morning that mo the mother was, com was uh, very sick and that they needed to rush to Calcutta, and the wedding of the brother was off. And so uh, uh, he was never able to see his mother alive again because by the time that he and his father arrived in Calcutta, his mother had passed. So both Norm and Yogananda had intuition and premonitions about their mother's death. Don, after this accident, decided to move his family to Burbank so he would not have to be gone from the home so long during the day. And Nana took care of Eileen night and day because now Norm's mother was completely bedridden. Norm's intuition was telling him that his mother was going to leave soon. That she wasn't long for this world. After the accident, Eileen's medical expenses consumed the family savings. Norm, who was now a student at Burbank High School, tried to keep up his studies and stay active on the football team, but he felt an obligation to find a job to help support the family. And he found one at a gas station next to the Lockheed plant. So he started working there and earning a little money that he could put into the family coffers. It was now 1945. Norm was 16 and Listen carefully, he stood six foot six inches and weighed 220 pounds, so he was not a small specimen. His old friend John Winship from Northridge had moved to Pasadena and he and, he and Norm began to hang out together, um, working out uh, with weights and they often went to Muscle Beach in Santa Monica for weightlifting and gymnastics. And some of you that heard me say that just now are going, Muscle Beach is in Venice, not Santa Monica. Well, I thought so too, but in 1945, Muscle Beach was still in Santa Monica. It didn't move to Venice until the 1950s. So anyway, driving home from Muscle Beach one day, they heard on the radio that the U.S. had dropped an atomic bomb on Japan. And three days later, a second bomb was dropped, and suddenly the war was over. And I remember when I was reading this chapter, I thought... Well, this is interesting that Norm wrote this, but he said this after, you know, his thoughts after that second bomb was dropped. He said, hundreds of thousands of poor souls who never had a chance to say goodbye to their loved ones, not even a moment to prepare for death, were caught up in the ravages of war, one of the great disasters suffered by modern man. So this had a, a great effect on on not only Norman, but uh, many, many people on this planet uh, when the atomic bomb was first dropped. So the war was over. Um, John and Norm and their new friend, Don, decided they should join the Merchant Marines. They knew it was really good money working on the ships and they would have a chance to see the world. So they decided to go together to San Pedro during the next week and apply for seamen's papers from the Coast Guard. And Norm wrote, Going to sea was part of my inner energy. In other words, he knew that this was his destiny. He knew that his karma on this planet would not be, in this lifetime, would not be complete without going to sea. I knew I had to go and besides... With all the money they promised, I would really be, it would really enable me to help out our family. So this was an interesting chapter because I would have uh, probably named this, it was the Warriors, so that was a perfect name. So, and Norman named it, so we'll, we'll leave it the Warriors. But it also is a chapter where you, you suddenly realize the passions that Norm has. 
the passions he's developed from his youth, uh, his passion for horses and horseback riding, his passion for farming and good farming equipment, his love of cowboys and ranching, his love of big, fast cars. Um, he developed a lifetime habit of bodybuilding. But I think the one thing that stands out for me mostly in this chapter about Norm's character was his love and his sense of responsibility for his family and the things that he gave up and the things that he had to do in order to help Don and Eileen through a very difficult time financially with only one of them working. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast this time. Please leave your comments on our podcast on YouTube as well as subscribing to our YouTube channel. Um, for next, our next podcast will be on chapter nine and the name of that chapter is Off to Sea. We'll talk to you soon.